Good morning. So I talk about predictability, so basically the rise of the machines. Uh, one of the models I really would like to have is whether I can predict a Sophia taxi has a tampered meter or not. 20, one way, eight, the other way, 15, this way, very surprising. So I'm going to talk about building these type of predictive models, but before this I need to actually get some more sample data, which means I'm going to do a couple of taxi rides this afternoon. With every technology, you really have to understand how it works. Otherwise, it is actually fairly dangerous. So I'm not going to talk about the silver bullet. I'm going to talk about something where you need to have some statistical background, computer science knowledge, and ultimately also understanding the domain. We all use machine learning every day. If you think about filtering spam from ham, that's actually not such an easy task. You can't just scan an email for a word like blue pill and then just decide, OK, uh, this is spam. Because if you would do this, your conversation with your friend about the Matrix movie and whether you're going to take the blue or the red pill would always end up in your junk email folder. So you need to understand the context. You're actually building complex trees to decide whether you actually talk about spam or that this particular email is something useful for you. Spotify. Who uses Spotify in here? So all the recommendations you get from Spotify, from Amazon, from any other online shop, they basically use recommendation engine, which learn what you like, what people with a similar profile like. That's all machine learning. So we talk about something which is called predictive analytics. So basically, you make predictions based on models. And these predictions, they're non never going to be 100% accurate. That's a key point, something to understand, that you make predictions with a probability. So for instance, Bing uh, analyzes historical flight data. And when you do a search for a flight, we make a prediction whether this flight is going to increase in price or not. So what we make here is we basically tell you, look, with an 80% probability, this flight is going to be $50 more or more uh, when you're not buying it now. So we basically make a prediction which can be true or not, and we, we say it's, it's a probability of 80%. And that's kind of a key point of machine learning. When you make predictions, you basically return a probability. And you, as the person who runs a particular system, need then to make a decision whether you buy it or not. Very hot at the moment, obviously, is predictive maintenance. Think about a car. Can you actually predict when a clutch is going to fail? Or even more important, large-scale plants, manufacturing plants. Can you predict when you have to maintain a certain machinery within a supply chain to avoid a breakdown of, of the whole plant? And that is all possible now because of IoT, because we have real-time data in chess. And when you have real-time data in chess, you actually can use machine learning to predict whether something is going to break within the next two or three weeks or not. And then the last thing really is uh, personal predictions, the predictive assistant. If you think about Cortana or Google Now, the idea there is to make personal predictions, recommend recommendations. So basically learning on your behavior, on your data, and then make predictions about stuff which is really relevant to you. So why, why today? I mean, machine learning is nothing new at all. And predictive analytics is not new. But I think you know, with big data, with the ability to process stuff at the large scale in the cloud, and with the ability to have real-time data in chest, this becomes extremely powerful. And that's why I think it's like the round two of predictive analytics, real-time predictions, and so forth. 
So what I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes is some fundamentals of machine learning. Then I'm going to introduce you to the data science life cycle. And I want to give you a couple of examples uh, what you can do with uh, predictive analytics and the approach you have to take. So a simple definition of machine learning literally is just algorithms and systems that improve their performance with experience. Experience is a key word in here. So you're actually in a cycle of training a model, use a model, reevaluate, train, reevaluate, train. And then the model becomes more accurate over time. If you look at the, the, the flow or, or, or the process you follow when you do machine learning, is the hard part is actually to get to a good data set. Imagine you want to do picture recognition. First of all, so our idea is we want to recognize a dog on a picture, and we want to recognize a car on a picture. So first, we need to have a lot of pictures. And then you need to have someone who labels these pictures and basically says, on this picture, we have a dog. On this picture, we have a car. On that picture, there is a house. Here is actually a dog and a car, and so forth. That's what you, what you call, you label the data. And then you're going to train the model. And to evaluate the performance of this model, you basically split this data, this labeled data, the goal that you created, you split it into a training section that you use to train the model. And then you evaluate that model by using the data that the model haven't seen. So you basically ask the model, please score, is this a, a car, a dog, or a car and a dog? And then you evaluate this and compare it to the actual label that you have. Because when you make predictions, when you use this model in real time, you don't have the label. You don't know whether it's a car, a dog, or a car and a dog. You rely on the model to recognize this and give you a probability bound. So that's kind of the classical flow here. You, you have a data set. You work on it to label it, to make it a useful data set, to learn, train the algorithm, and then you evaluate this algorithm by basically scoring it. If you're happy with it, you take this trained model and you can put it into production and make actually real-time scoring. So how does this whole workflow look like? And before I dig into the detail, I would like to kind of go one step back and introduce you a little bit about the, the whole area of data science. Because machine learning, if, if you think about what machine learning is, it is the overlap of mathematics and computer skills. That's the overlap of machine learning. If you now combine this with domain knowledge, then you end up with data science. If you only have domain knowledge and mathematics, then we call it traditional research. And if you only have domain knowledge and computer skills, but no mathematical skills, that's called the danger zone. Because you're going to make conclusions based on statistically irrelevant data. Like me making a prediction about the taxi driver, although I only have five taxi rides in Sofia. So back in uh, 1854 in London, uh, Dr. John Snow uh, was kind of curious about the cholera outbreak. Because everyone thought it's an airborne disease. And he was sure it's not airborne, it's actually a waterborne disease. So the approach he took is basically, hey, let's plot the outbreak on a map. And because he believes it's a waterborne disease, he started to plot the wells, so basically the water pumps, on the very same map. And to him, it, it was a clear indication that if you look at this, it must be this broad street water pump which causes the disease. But now the whole data science process really kicks in because you now have to 
take other data into account as well. And he just sees, oh, we have noisy data. So even sows, there are color outbreaks. And interestingly, there is an anomaly in a brewery right in Soho. So he couldn't explain why there were no outbreaks in the brewery. He couldn't explain why there was another uh, cell of outbreaks south. So what he did is he basically asked someone who understands the domain. And in this case, it was actually a person who knows how people live there. And to him, it was very, very clear. Because the mothers brought their kids north to school and on the way back, they brought water with them. So that's how you explain why there is an outbreak in the south. And the brewery had their own water pump. And that's, that's kind of the process, making sense out of the data, getting insight. So the first thing is always you need to have a question. What's the problem you want to solve? And it's a huge difference whether you ask, when is the clutch going to break? Or your question is, does this clutch, or what's the likelihood that this clutch breaks within the next three months? That's a complete different question that requires different processes to approach it. So once you have your question, you need to think about what is the data. In his case, he used the map, he used the, the water pumps, he used the cholera outbreaks and additional geographical information. In our case, most likely, you're going to use multiple data sources. One data source might be Twitter, another data source might be weather data and so forth. And then you correlate this uh, with your car rental information. And based on this, you can make a prediction uh, how many cars did you most likely need to provide on a Sunday in June if the weather is nice. So you're building actually that particular model. And then you need to evaluate and critique it. Talk together with the people who understand the domain inside out whether the model you develop actually makes sense. And if it makes sense, you deploy it, so you basically put it into production, whether this is a web service or part of a business process. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. So the first one is, how can you build a recommendation engine? I want to recommend you movies based on user reviews. It's actually super easy today, because the only thing you need is a, is a triple of user ID, movie ID, but this could be an article, a book, a CD, whatever, uh, and a rating. Then you build a model, and what you really see is just the split of the training data. You take an algorithm. In our case, this is a matchbox recommender uh, learning algorithm. You train the model. You score the model. That's it. So the result of this is you come in with a certain item, which means a movie, and you get five other movies recommended. So that's how you build today a recommendation engine. It's extremely simple. You can obviously add additional uh, data sets for user profiles, for item profiles, and so forth. Let's have a look at the second example. How can you make a demand prediction? So assume you have a car sharing fleet in Sofia, and you want to predict demand on a, uh, on a, on a location per day, per hour, so you can ensure that these cars are actually located in that particular cluster. So the first thing you have to do is you have to create an hourly pickup heat map. So you take all your data and put it into a format that you know per cluster that you define, what's the demand per hour, per day, per month, and then you can actually add additional information to this, like how was the weather, and so forth. This then looks like this. So for instance, what we have here is um, it's actual cell phone data that we aggregated uh, in Beijing. So you have a heat map, and you see you know, where a lot of people come together on a particular hour. So the second step then really is now you make predictions. So you train a model by using this data per cluster. So you basically say, I have now one entry per day, month, hour. And that's a number which says, 
50 cars in this cluster during that hour. So you can train this model now, and you ac can extend this with information like how was the weather, was there a specific event, uh, have there been holidays, and so forth. So you train the model. In this case, what you see is I actually use two different algorithms. So one is called a multi-class decision forest. The other class is a multi-class decision jungle. And I just look and evaluate which of these algorithms perform the best. And the outcome I'm going to get are then probabilities, where one means it's a very high probability, uh, it's a high demand, and four means it's a low demand. And if you look at this, I can't give you an accurate prediction about the demand. The only thing I can give you is, is mostly around 70. The accuracy is around 75% of the prediction. If you get to a prediction which is close to 100%, you're overfitting the model, and it's most likely extremely biased to your uh, towards your training data. So if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, you can go to the Machine Learning Center, uh, play around with these models. There are a couple of already built-in examples like uh, network intrusion detection, anonymity detection, we have risk predictions in there, uh, churn predictions, and so forth. Uh, with this, I would like to hand over to the next speaker, and then we can have questions in the panel.